Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 8, Society of Strangers. Jessica LeBay is a registered nurse who lives and works in Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. I know her only from social media, but I have been appreciating her perspectives and knowledge for many months, especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic. We spoke on April 29, 2020 by Skype. We talked about U.S.-Canadian differences in healthcare, governance, and the culture at large. She also had some very astute observations to make about media, not only regarding its messaging, but also its nature. In general, I find it refreshing to converse with someone who is not a U.S. American, and Jessica was certainly no exception. I hope you enjoy our interview as much as I did. I've been a registered nurse for 12 years, and I have worked in neonatal intensive care primarily. I work primarily on a unit that deals with cardiac surgery and other anomalies after birth that require surgery. And I also work on another unit where we deal with premature infants. And in my time nursing, I've also taught at a university for three years, and I've also helped roll out computer charting around the province. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So we're known as Canada's festival city. We have tons of festivals throughout the summer, but we are not having any this summer. And uh, we are also known as, as Canada's most northern city, which I take some issue with because there are other cities north of us, uh, Yellowknife, for example, and Whitehorse, but um, we are Canada's most northern major city. Alberta is somewhat similar culturally, I understand, to the U.S. Midwest in that it's more conservative than the coasts? Yes, very much so. Um, I would say we are probably the most politically conservative government and place in Canada. I would not say that about our culture at all. I've heard Edmonton compared to Austin, Texas, and then there's a city two and a half hours south of us that I've heard compared to Dallas, Texas. So we're very oil and gas focused. We're very agriculture focused. Um, Our provincial government has primarily been conservative for, gosh, over 40 years, except for the last four years leading up to 2019, we had a a NDP government, which... um, I'm not entirely sure how to categorize in a way that is not going to send alarm bells down some people's spines. I think it's what you guys would call more socialist, but it's not a socialist government. It's it's not democratic socialism either, but it's not conservative and it's not liberal. It's something else. Right, because you have more than just two parties up there. Yeah, we have, I think we have five in our federal government right now. And on any given election, we have we usually have three or four that are kind of vying for seats. And then there's some outliers as well that, that very rarely get in anything. Now, I'd forgotten that Alberta, I knew that it was agricultural, but I had forgotten that there's also a lot of fossil fuel exploration that happens there. That is primarily what we have up here. We have what are known as the tar sands or the oil sands. That's about three hours north of where I am right now. And there's been a lot of news about them in the last, well, in my lifetime, really. Yeah, it's quite a project. And with the way that oil has tanked in the last little while, our province is scrambling. Right, because the prices are falling very steeply there as well. Yeah, and our provincial government, when they set out their budget before the pandemic happened, they were banking on oil being above $50 a barrel. And now they're looking at a huge deficit. And given that this is a very conservative government ideologically, I'm not so sure they're actually conservative fiscally, but they were very much going a hard line with the economics in this this province, and they're not going to be able to meet their goals. Right. So when it comes to the healthcare coverage in Canada, I think a lot of people in the United States don't know much about Canada, except that it sounds like it's better. It also differs from province to province too, doesn't it? 
yes and also no. So healthcare in Canada is, it's, it's federally guaranteed, but it is administered by each province. And so each province, it's a large part of their budget for the year. It's usually actually their biggest expenditure for the year. And so there is a common perception, you know, you always hear that Canadian healthcare is free, which is and is also not true. So we we do have free healthcare in the sense that nobody will ever be turned down treatment. But that being said, it is insured healthcare. So I have to have insurance to receive a lot of treatments actually. And that insurance is not necessarily mandated, but it is a very intelligent thing to have because if you don't have it, you'll end up paying $350 for an ambulance ride. And also, even though we have insurance, there are some procedures that are still pay out of pocket. And then on top of that too, we're starting to have diagnostic imaging places open up in Alberta anyways. I actually don't know what it's like in other provinces, but where you can pay to have a diagnostic imaging test done faster than you would be able to have it done in the public system. But once you get into the hospital in I think anywhere in Canada, you're not sent a bill for anything like that. You would never see your hospital bill. That is free. But actually getting to the hospital or things that could happen in your doctor's office or even medications are not necessarily free. It all depends on your insurance plan. But for example, pharmaceuticals are less expensive, I believe, in Canada than in the United States. Some of them, yes, I believe so. Some of them are if you have insurance and not all of them. I know that there's been a lot of issues with cancer drugs in the last little while. And for example, my father is is suffering from Parkinson's. And if he didn't have insurance, his medications would be over $5,000 a month. Wow, that's a big deal. Yeah. So do you uh, ever talk to people in the United States who have a similar job as you do and, and, and hear sort of the contrast between the two systems? Um, I actually work with nurses in Canada that have worked in the United States. It's a common thing for a lot of us to go do. We call it travel nursing. So we have to write a different exam to practice in the United States. But if we do that, we can take contracts down there. Um, it's a it's a bit of a complicated process, and there's usually a recruitment company and all of that. But I had a friend that was working in California. Um, actually, I work with a few with a few people who have worked in California and Texas here and there, and. It does sound different to me. Um, the hospital where my one friend worked at, it was a Kaiser hospital, I believe she said. And so anybody who had Kaiser insurance would go to that hospital. And she wasn't standing there scanning everything for barcodes and running up a bill. But she said that she did work in a hospital years ago where your patient would get a bill at the end of it. And coming back to Canada and telling us this, we just, we we honestly can't fathom it. It's just so foreign to my understanding of of my workplace and what my job entails and to think I mean I'm very obviously conscious and and careful of what I use for supplies but still if I need a syringe I go grab a syringe I don't think about it twice you know I don't I don't think about what the cost of the patient is going to be or anything like that we definitely talk about what the cost to the healthcare system is and we try to minimize waste that way but it does sound like a completely different environment to me, a completely different world to me. Yeah, I'm a little shocked, actually, to hear what you just said, uh, to, oh. hear, <laughs> to, to hear that that, um, that you would never get a bill. I mean, no. this is just wow. I mean, that's a big no. difference, because in the United States, that's just a, that's definitely a thing. Like yeah. hospital bills, like those are those are dark words. You don't, you know, yeah. That's always a, a worry and a concern right up there as much as the health concern itself is in many cases mm -hmm. is, oh, gosh, how is this going to get paid for? Well, and and looking at some of the patients that I work with on a daily basis, I truly cannot imagine what that would be like for a family who didn't have insurance or whose insurance ran out or something like that. That's just not something I have to think about. And so where I am. A lot of my patients need a very extensive heart surgery shortly after birth, and then they might need follow-up surgeries after that. So, for example, for something called a hypoplastic left heart, where a baby is born with the left ventricle being small, um, they have to go through three major surgeries by the time they're six years old. And each one of those surgeries has a fairly long hospital stay. And then there's the, the possibility of complications. And then those complications can be pretty major that require a lot of medication 
and a lot of equipment and a lot of stuff. And I, I cannot fathom getting a bill for something like that. It's just not a question around here about if we treat, we're just going to treat. And that's what happens. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing to hear. It's nice to hear that too, to hear that that's possible. That being said, though, healthcare is a huge expenditure and it's one that we're constantly struggling with because the system as it is built is not built for what we're doing with extreme life saving measures and with extension of life pretty much at all costs. And so I think what this pandemic has really illustrated for us, and I think for, for the states too, from what I understand, is that if things are puttering along normally, normally <laughs> being, you know, in air quotations, our system is able to manage. And as soon as something like this happens, we are no longer able to manage. It, it totally shows the capacity of the system and the lack of capacity of the system. And it definitely makes this question really, what are we doing and, and what are we treating and why are we treating and, and, you know, how are we treating as well? So in my province, I think when the pandemic hit, they said something like there was, this isn't a direct number, but around 550 ICU beds in the whole province, which on a good day are 90% full. So when you get something like a pandemic hitting, what happens to those people who would normally be occupying those beds? What happens with the space that we don't have now for the excess that is going to be caused by the pandemic? And then what are the trickle-down effects of that within the system? So, yes, we, we definitely treat at all costs, but some of those hospital stays can be months, years long. And what is the cost to that to the system? And and just because it's all on the taxpayer and also on the insurance does not mean that it's free and without consequence, too. You've brought up the topic of the pandemic. And I have to ask you, there mm -hmm. are the people who are saying in one way or another that this just isn't real. I can say it is it is real. It is happening. Um my best friend's grandfather actually just died from COVID last Thursday, um, 88 years old. And I don't know if he was in a care home. I'm assuming he probably was. As somebody who works in a hospital, I have friends that are dealing with, with COVID patients. And I can tell you, this is, this is real. This is happening. I can understand, though, as well, you know, living in this place that I do that right now, we're not seeing a surge of it. I can understand how people would think that this is an overreaction. And honestly, I I can't say that it is and I can't say that it isn't. I think more than anything, this is an ongoing science experiment. I don't think anybody knows what to do. I don't think anybody knows really what's happening or what's going to happen. And I think more than anything, this is a test of, of leadership if you have leadership or if you don't. And I've been pleasantly surprised by some of the people, by some of the elected leaders in my country. Um, ones I didn't think I would be pleasantly surprised by ever have really stepped up and shown a lot of grace in this crisis. And I'm thankful for that. And I think that that has actually had a big, a big influence on how it hasn't really hit my country in a big way. There's been problems in Ontario and Quebec, um, but those are very populated areas of the country. And, you know, generally speaking, my province has been led through this crisis by our chief medical officer. She has shown up just about every single day on the news. She's been a, a breath of fresh air. She's been totally transparent. She's been calm, cool, collected. And there hasn't been a lot of politicizing about the actual crisis itself. The moment has been used as a political moment and our provincial government has done things while we're all indoors and unable to protest. But generally speaking, um, the crisis hasn't been used as a political thing. So I think that that's made a really big difference. What kinds of things has your province done? You said that you would be able to, <laughs> you wish that you could be out on the street. Uh, they shoved through a pipeline <laughs> while um. we were all at home and they passed a very draconian bill, but they're actually going back on it right now because it was a little too far. It basically gave them legislative power to just any member could legislate whatever he wanted. 
And that just didn't go over very well, even with people sitting at home. So, I mean, there's definitely very real concerns about people who are tyrants or who have a tyrannical side to them of taking mm -hmm. advantage in a situation like this. Yeah, and I think that those are valid concerns, but I don't think it needs to be a binary of this isn't real and the government is just doing this to screw us all versus this is real. You know, I think I think there's a time and a place for everything. And so I think my approach has been, okay, this doesn't feel good. I I am not a fan of being told what to do. I am not a fan of my freedoms and my privacy is being taken away. But there is a time and place. And so the civic minded thing for me to do right now, and especially given what I do for a living, is to suck this up and observe and stay alert while this is going on. And if the crisis has passed and our government is still behaving in this way, that's a different story to me. That is a different day. But while this is acutely happening and while we're trying to figure out what's going on, I'm okay with a little bit of my freedoms being infringed on. Well, I wonder if that's even the right way to put it, uh, that our yeah. freedoms are being infringed upon, because really in a, situ in a society of responsible adults where we felt like caring for one another, we would be using our freedom to choose to act in an intelligent way. Well, and I even struggle with the notion of freedom um, the way that we're using it, because that freedom is being determined by the state in the first place. So really, how free am I? If they're telling me what I can and cannot do, if they're if they're legislating my rights, if they're if they're legislating my movements anyways, this is just more legislation on the things that they were already legislating. So yeah, I have to agree with you that in in a society of responsible adults, this would simply be the thing that you do. And I think that that's something that I've been thinking about that a lot lately, actually, of of the response up here. Um, I've noticed in my city, as soon as this hit, there was a huge grassroots community response and people were just looking to take care of one another. And I very much appreciated that more than I could have appreciated, you know, the government telling me I have to stand six feet apart from people or I have to do this or I have to do that. There was just this instant instinctual almost just call to arms of the citizen citizenry citizenship to take care of one another and and i think i think that that's what i'm seeing in the stores and stuff right now where people are just automatically doing six feet away from each other without having to be asked or questioned i just talked to my friend in new york city who's having a very different experience than i am up here Given the area that I work in, being with babies, we weren't really expecting to be hit very hard by it, given what we were seeing about who it was affecting in the population. We were expecting to see more of the trickle-down effects of that. And so the unit that I work in, we get babies from all over Western Canada, very specialized cases from all over Western Canada. But I believe because of the travel restrictions between provinces, a lot of babies weren't able to come to us unless they absolutely needed to. And then there was also restrictions on surgeries as well. So my unit actually cleared out of, of patients. And for the first two weeks of the pandemic, I was working quite a bit because a lot of our nurses were coming back from other places. They had been on vacation or they had been somewhere or they had been exposed to somebody who had been on vacation. So a lot of our staff was self-isolating for about two weeks. And then when that was finished, all of a sudden, all of our staff was home for once and there was no babies. And so I'm relief staff. I fill in the gaps. I don't actually have a full-time position, but I do work over full-time hours. And I couldn't get a shift for about three weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we have not had a surge where I am right now in this city. Um, Calgary, the city to the south of us, has had much more cases than we have. I think they're sitting at 1,400 active cases right now. And the last time I looked, my city had 87 active cases. Right, that's not very many at all. And that's in the whole city. That's not people in the hospital. That's just 87 positive cases. How extensive has the testing been in Canada? Uh, fairly extensive. They were doing quite a bit at first, and then they were doing targeted for a couple weeks. And in the last two weeks, it's been if you have symptoms, you get a test. If you are a healthcare worker and you've been exposed to somebody who has a confirmed COVID diagnosis or somebody with a suspected diagnosis, you get a test. So 
yeah, the, the testing has been quite extensive. In the United States, the testing has not been very widespread so far, and so it's hard to know exactly how bad the numbers are. Yeah, and I've actually been wondering if that has to do with is testing free or do people have to pay for it? Are tests available? I just don't understand how that happens. My impression is that there are very few tests that are available and that you have to pay for them. Yeah. Up here, we have a phone number that is manned by registered nurses, and I've been working that phone number as well. And if people think they have symptoms or if they think that they've been exposed, they've been encouraged to call the phone number. So when they call the phone number, they'll talk to somebody like me, and then I go through an algorithm that basically determines if they need immediate medical care. So if we need to call an ambulance and send it to them, if they can go into a clinic within four to six hours, or if they can be seen within 24 hours. And then in that conversation as well, I also tell them if they need a test. And so if they are flagged for testing, they get a phone call from our healthcare system, which then tells them where to go and when. And it's a secret location. I don't even know where it is. I think because they didn't want people just showing up. But then you go, you get your test, and then you go home and you are legally required to self-isolate. And so that's up to you to self-isolate on your own? It's up to you. But if you have had a test and your test results are not back, or if they are back positive, and if you're caught outside, you will be fined. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of any stories of anything even that restrictive happening in the United States yet. And that's not even very restrictive by global standards. Mm -hmm. I've heard of a couple people who have been pulled over by, by the police for whatever reason. And from what I've heard, for the most part, the police prefer to educate instead of fine. But if you're caught outside a second time, then obviously you're going to be fined. But for people who don't have to self-isolate, so with somebody like me who has some symptoms and I haven't been exposed, I can go outside, I can go for walks, I can go to the grocery store. It's not a comfortable experience at this point in time. I can go for a walk with a friend as long as they're six feet away from me. We can still gather in up to 15 people as long as everybody's six feet apart, but most people aren't doing that. But I've definitely noticed a large increase in outdoor traffic. Suddenly everybody's walking their dog and walking their kids. Is this because they're home from work or? Yeah, I think so. There's been massive, massive layoffs where I am between the drop in oil and the pandemic shuttering a lot of businesses. The city that I'm in is very entrepreneurial. We have, well, we had a wicked restaurant scene, really great art scene, lots of little shops, and a lot of those places haven't been able to stay open. There's similar stories happening here as well. So are people wearing masks there? Yes, and also no. I have seen some people wearing masks, and they were, married, they were wearing masks early on. And then I think about two weeks ago, our chief medical officer said it was a recommendation, but not a requirement. And I feel like since then, I've, I've actually seen less people wearing masks. But the physical distancing is definitely a thing here. People are really respecting it. All the stores have one-way aisles and tape on the floor and you know exactly where to stand and when. And I find people are doing wide circles around each other, even in parking lots. So the message does seem to be registering, not necessarily with the mask wearing, though. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... In the Asian countries, it's been much more common for everyone to mask up, and some people feel as though that's had a positive effect on keeping the situation under control. Yeah, and I think I think that is warranted given the asymptomatic spread. Being obviously in the profession that, that you're in, you must feel like you've got a good rundown on the best information available and what to do and what not to do as well. I do, and I also have already worked and lived through H1N1. I worked through that pandemic, which had a completely different feel to the response than this one does. 
And I actually got H1N1. And so I learned a lot from that experience. But yeah, I would say from day one that I haven't ever, I haven't felt afraid of this, not of the virus itself or not of catching it or anything like that. I have been very worried for my colleagues that work with adults. I'm very fortunate in that I'm not in that space. And I do think about them a lot as I do have friends that are working with COVID patients right now. And of course, you hear the horror stories of, you know, 33-year-old person who is perfectly well, nurse, and yeah, they died and all that kind of stuff. But I've, I've felt pretty good about it, although there are there does seem to be aspects of this virus that we still don't know very much about. And it does seem to be changing rapidly about what we are finding out about it. So I have felt good, but also not good at times too. Yeah, it still seems like we're probably early on, uh, too early on to know what to expect. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to be mindful of what media I'm consuming. Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of headlines and stuff like that as well. My first degree is actually in psychology and sociology. And I remember when I was taking my sociology degree, really, really examining media messaging and, and trying to deconstruct headlines. And so, for example, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine sent me a headline that said something along the lines of WHO cannot guarantee immunity after COVID-19. And I read the headline and I was like, oh my gosh, people can get it twice. That's terrible. And then I sat back for a minute and I thought about it. I'm like, WHO cannot confirm immunity of COVID-19 because they don't have enough information yet. There hasn't been enough of a sample size yet that has been exposed to it twice. How many how many double positives do we have? Like how many, how many people out there have actually gotten it twice? And so I kind of sat back for a moment. I took a deep breath and I said, okay, cannot confirm because they don't know. But you read the headline only and it just sounds like, oh my gosh, this is just never going to end and it's going to carry on forever. And it just sounded so dire. Misconceptions is definitely, that was something I wanted to talk about with you mm -hmm. as much as you had to say about it, uh, simply because there are so many right now, in large part because of stories that are going around that are that are misleading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say personally that when I was about 23 years old, um, I was living by myself and I was finishing my first degree and I constantly had CNN on in the background for background noise. I didn't think that I was listening to it all that much, but it definitely still got into my head. And I was very down and out with the world and I was just having a very hard time with life because of it, because I couldn't discern anymore what was happening immediately and what was immediate in my world. I couldn't discern what was happening over there in Iran versus what was happening right here in front of me. It all felt very real all of the time. And so I, I made a choice not to have cable, not to expose myself to 24-hour news and that kind of stuff. And I've been realizing, especially during this pandemic, but over the last couple of years, that things like Facebook have really just replicated the 24-hour news. You see the same headline, you see the same article over and over, maybe by different news places or maybe not by news places at all. And it just gets spread and spread and spread to the point where you've seen something 10 times in a day and all of a sudden in your mind, it's true. It's just that has to be true. And so I've seen a lot of what I would consider misinformation, um, you know, what people are calling conspiracy theories. And for me, the frustrating part isn't necessarily the information that's being spread itself. That is definitely frustrating when it's just outright, that is not a thing you know, but the frustrating part for me is I think seeing people so certain that they have, they have found the truth or, you know, they know better than you and just the fighting that I've seen between people. And that goes both ways, you know, people who are being terrible to people because they believe in some conspiracy theory or people who are being terrible to people because they listen to the mainstream media. To me, it's it's two sides of the same coin where you're just trying desperately to grasp some kind of control over a situation that ultimately you have no control over. And to believe that we have control over anything really has been a huge lesson to me over the last couple of years, but definitely in a situation like this where 
when I see people spreading that kind of stuff and, and trying to hammer it home and, you know, trying to spread it to their friends lists and trying to get people on board, I do understand that the intent behind it is probably good, that they probably want people to, you know, in their minds, wake up or they want people to to care about this thing or, or they want to help people be healthy. But to me, it's it's no more helpful than just spreading news article after news article after news article. There is very little critical thinking put in, into those things. That's very well put. I'm, I'm glad that you got into all of that. I think that partly what we're seeing here is the fact that there has been a very distinct break with business as usual. Yeah. With what people consider to be normal day to day life. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think most people have had their day to day life impacted in a significant way by this. And so yeah. people are reacting differently now to that, to the disturbance. Yeah, absolutely. And I do have to say with that, this isn't a disturbance to the day-to-day -day life of everybody. This is a disturbance to the day-to-day -day life of some people, the majority of people, I would say, in this part of the world who are used to being taken care of in some way by the state, you know, whether, whether that be simply assuming that there will be food on the shelves, because there's always been food on the shelves. But I would say not for everybody that this has been a huge disruption. You know, there, there's definitely people who are removed from the dominant system and removed from the mainstream system who it's been a disruption for them too, I think, but probably a lot less of a shock. But I would say that it's probably been a really big shock for the guy on Wall Street who's used to eating out every single meal and expecting that his convenience lifestyle is going to continue indefinitely than it has been for somebody who perhaps has already had some hard run-ins with society as we know it. So at your hospital, is it, like I mentioned earlier, my sister is in the hospital, and right now my mm -hmm. parents can't go and visit her because the whole hospital mm -hmm. is on lockdown. Is that a similar situation where you're at? No, it's not. So the long-term care homes have had severe restrictions on them. Um, the hospitals did for a little while, except in certain circumstances. So for example, in the NICU where I work, it would have been just outright cruel to ban parents from seeing their babies. Um, so for a while, we were limited to one visitor. And now we've changed it to one visitor per day, but it could and two designated visitors period. So mom and dad can visit just not on the same day. And all, I think all of the hospitals and now long term care as of I think today, actually, you're able to visit somebody if they're dying essentially, as well. But there are still severe restrictions. And at the doors of all the hospital, there's screening teams. So they screen you for basically risk factors. And if you have a fever or any symptoms, even when I go to work, I have to get screened every single day before I'm allowed to go to work now. And I have to wear a mask at work 24 seven. So what is your general impression? And you don't have to be polite here looking south uh, over the border from where you are. Oh man, that's that's a big question. I'm sad. I'm I'm really very grief stricken um, when I look at what is what is happening or what seems to be happening, anyways. Even, I mean, I I can't say for cer for certain what is happening in your country. I mean, I'm sure it's different in some places than it is in other places. But I have friends from all over the United States. Some people that I consider some of my most kindred spirits, and to know what they must be feeling, to imagine the fear, and to imagine the uncertainty, and then to, I don't know, I, I just, I, I, my, yeah, my, my Canadian brain is, is stumbling a little bit right here, because um, I feel like you're, the media is not helping. I feel like the, your leadership, if you want to call it that, is is definitely stoking the flame of an already terrible situation. And I'm stunned by the hyper-individuality that I've seen at some of the protests and with some of the um, 
the buying habits that were happening early on here, although that was happening here as well. People were panic buying, and I have to wonder about that reaction. To me, it's not a response to a situation. It's a reaction. It's, it's the nervous system kicking in. But I, when I look at the news to the south of me, um, my nervous system kicks in, and I feel anxious because I... I just, I'm, I'm stunned. I'm truly stunned. The comparison in government responses and messaging is stunning to me. I think that people here are very insular and very focused only on the United States. And so they don't understand just how much of an outlier the United States is in this situation. Yeah, I've, uh, I've traveled extensively in my 20s. Some of the things that I'm seeing coming out of the South to me are, I won't say that they're things I never expected to see, but still seeing them is is shocking to me. I mean, I've, I've traveled in places that you're not supposed to love going. And when I was in some of those places at the time, um, Syria, for example, I remember thinking to myself constantly, the people are not their government. Like the people are are not well represented by their government. And thinking to myself at the time too, it's no different than the States. And it's no different than where I am either. People are just trying to live their lives. They're trying to have their families. They're trying to put food on their table. You know, most people are just trying to live their lives. And to actually see this breakdown to the south of me is stunning. It's truly stunning. And given that our government up here has been very science focused and very transparent and very ordered, very calm, uh, respectful of, I feel very respected. It's been shocking to see the lack of care. I think that that is what is really striking to me is the lack of care coming from your leadership. That's definitely the way that it feels to be here. I mean, um, mm -hmm. I have a friend who happened to be visiting Thailand right before all of this hit. So she went there in, in early March, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, right before. With the, she's visiting there with her mother. And she ended up kind of getting stuck there, really. It's, it's, it's too hard to come back right now. And they extended all the visas there. They made it easy for the tourists to just stay. So she stayed there. But she's staying on an island there. And she was telling me about what it's like there and what kind of measures they were taking and this and that. And I heard myself saying to her, wow, well, you're in a much better place than if you were here. You should be happy that you're there. Yeah. And I realized at that moment, wow, I'm in a bad place for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit mind boggling, you know, to see a country with so many resources and a fairly educated population struggle so much through this. It's been very, very shocking to watch. Yeah, we're just handling it poorly. And I feel as though I have to try to figure out what the most intelligent way to behave is, you know, on my own and then try yeah. to implement that as best as I can. I think that that right there illustrates some of my grief over what I'm seeing actually is people, individuals having to figure this out on their own because the sense that I'm getting from a lot of my friends in the States is that they're without anything that could be called community. I'm finding a lot of my friends who I consider very community-minded people left on their own. They don't know their neighbors. They don't necessarily have a reliable group of people that they can count on. There aren't supports. There doesn't seem to be a lot of that going on for the most part, especially it seems for people in cities. And I just can't help but think about how a society of perpetual strangers doesn't function well during something like this because you are left to fend for yourself. And Personally, I I don't ever want to be on my own through something like this. You know, I, I've been I've been so blessed to have friends checking in on me and offering to bring food if to my family if I get stuck at the hospital. I 
I actually live with my parents right now because of my dad's Parkinson's and I can't imagine being anywhere else. And it gives me great comfort to know that I know all my neighbors and that I know the girl at the grocery store, you know, and we're, when we're both having a bad day, we can just give each other a look. And I know her well enough to say like, I'm sorry, this sucks. And the other thing too, that's going on in my city is um, we've managed to get the city council on board with ripping up empty lots and we're going to be doing mass planting of urban spaces for food security and those are things that have been organized by groups within the city so for example the Edmonton Permaculture Guild I believe had a lot to do with that there's something so heartbreaking about seeing the consequences of a society of of strangers you put that very well a society of strangers that's what it feels like for sure So I used to be an urban farmer myself back Mm -hmm. in the day. I ran a CSA, so I just had my curiosity piqued about what you said was going on with with, uh, ripping up empty lots for gardens. Yeah, so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. It was just announced a couple days ago. But in 2008, our city ran a program where a lot of empty lots, people or groups could rent out and start community gardens if they wanted to. And I think they had a pretty good success rate with it. In 2019, they didn't run it again. And then this year with this going on, quite a few people were asking them to do something about it again. There's a lot of people who are ripping up their lawns and planting gardens and planting gardens in their backyards. And suddenly, you know, having green grasses is, is not so trendy anymore. But yeah, it was just announced a couple of days ago that the city is going to be getting on board and helping. I don't know if they'll be bringing in equipment or helping with fast applications. I don't think they actually really know what it's going to look like entirely yet, but they said that there will be support for urban agriculture, for better food security for this area. And then I think they're also going to be helping people with victory gardens as well. That's great to hear. Yeah, I live in a place where, you know, for the last two years, there has been an online map of all the fruit trees in the city so that you can go and forage fruit for yourself. Like, it's an interesting place to be at this time. And I'm I'm very grateful that I am where I am. On the subject of the virus and the pandemic, how should people be approaching this right now, do you think? That's a big question, because I've seen everything from people, you know, waxing spiritual and and philosophical and scientific and there's so many different approaches to look at this from and I I think that they're all valid I myself was pretty much home for about two weeks because I couldn't get work and and I I didn't want to expose my family unnecessarily so I pretty much stayed home and during those two weeks I definitely found my myself drifting into black and white thinking just because I wasn't getting out enough and I wasn't conversing with people as much as I normally do and I was spending too much time on the computer. I think more than anything to approach this time with a huge sense of I don't know because none of us know what's going on right now and I don't think we will know for some time what this is about I think any attempt to contextualize it is a desperate plea for control and a desperate plea to set up some kind of lens. But I don't know. I'm just I'm really learning to roll with it and not get stuck with the in the absolutes and to really practice ambivalence in this moment of being able to hold multiple thoughts at once about what this is and what's happening. And more than anything, I I hope people stay alert to that and keep their minds flexible throughout this. And that involves or requires some self-reflection, some self-awareness. I think that involves a lot of surrender as well and a lot of humility and a lot of ability to just say, you know what, this sounds like something seductive right now. This argument is really, really, really dragging me in. It's probably not something I should get stuck on. I caught myself a couple weeks ago just getting stuck on the news and stuck on the stories and having to step back and, and, you know, stuck on some really great articles by people that I I really appreciate their thinking and I really appreciate their philosophy, but also having to step back and go, what makes you so certain right now? What is so seductive about certainty in this moment? And yeah, just having to step back and go, you're, you're just as human as I am. You have no clue what's going on. Like, thank you for your five cents. And I appreciate it. I'm going to put it in my back pocket and I'm going to think about it, but I'm not going to take it as gospel. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, 
on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.